Hey guys, Tyler here taking another step on the journey to master programmer. So today I'm going to be going over the first part of week one in the NAND to Tetris course. Week one starts off talking about Boolean logic and Boolean algebra. So Boolean logic is the idea of zeros and ones and how these can be used in computations to get results of more zeros and ones. The computations are going to be using some operations specific to Boolean values. So these operations are not, and, and or, and of course, nand. So just like arithmetic has plus and minus and times and divide, and as you'll see in programming, the classes you define will have their own operations Boolean values have these operations, not, and, and, or, and, nand, and of course you'll see many others that are composed of these. So, Boolean algebra. We're going to be taking zeros and ones, as I said, and making results, zeros or ones. That's it. It's just zeros and ones. Trues, false, ons, offs. That's all it is in computers. Now, because it's just zeros and ones, you can create things called truth tables for a given computation. If you have just one variable, let's call it x, its values can be 0 and 1. So its results are going to be 0 and 1. Now, if you have two variables, x and y, and then the result, you'll have several more values. You could have zero for x or one for x and zero for y or one for y. You'll also notice if you've ever done any counting in binary, zero, zero is where you start and then you go zero, one, then one, zero, then one, one. You can easily fill up any amount of variables with just doing simple binary counting. Now these are the only possible states that two variables can be in, just 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So you can create complete truth tables. You can't do this for things like regular integer arithmetic because those numbers are from negative infinity to infinity. But because we're using such a limited scope, we can create complete truth tables. So with x and y, let's say the result that we want is 0 if they're both 0, 1 in this case, one in this case, and zero if they're both one. Now you'll see that this is actually the XOR or exclusive OR. And they uh, Shimon Shakin uh, talks a lot about this in the uh, NAND to Tetris course. So this is XOR is the example they use in uh, week one. Now there's a concept of Boolean function synthesis. Now at first this really confused me, so I wanted to talk about this a little bit and hopefully clear it up if anyone else was confused. But after I thought about it for a little bit, it actually became very clear and incredibly insightful. So for any truth table, you can have an actual function. So say a, a simple computation would be x and y. Now this is such a simple function. This is just like x plus y, but a fully complicated function could be something like x plus y, y times z in arithmetic, or in Boolean algebra, it could be x and y or z. So for any truth table, you can have one single Boolean function that will perfectly describe it. The way this works is you go to each result and you find where it has a one, and you'll write out the Boolean function that would compute for this to be a one and only that to be a one. And then you would do that for each result that is a one. So for the first one right here, a valid uh, Boolean function would be not X and Y. So not X and Y. Now you can also use parentheses just to make things clear. Okay, so now we have not X and Y. What this means is when you have zero into not x, not just flips the zero to one, so you get a one, 
and y is 1, of course, just because it's straight plugged in, it's just a literal value, then you have 1 and 1, which equals true, or 1. Now, if we just move that up a little bit, we'll have room to write a similar function for this one. This one's going to be x, because that's just a literal value, and not y. So now we have x and not y. And of course, we can add parentheses however you want to make it very clear. So that works because x goes in 1, and then not y, because it's a 0, it becomes a 1. 1 and 1 equals 1. So we have two Boolean functions. We can combine these together so that they work as one Boolean function to cover this entire truth table by adding a simple or between the two. And then it's that Boolean function or this Boolean function. So if we were to uh, write that more clearly, clearly right here, we would have not x, and I'm just going to write a big A for and, and y, or x and not y. So this one function right here is the function that describes this truth table. Now this function has a fancy name called a canonical representation because it is the one function that can be derived from here. Now of course you can simplify this function just like you can simplify a function in arithmetic, you can simplify Boolean algebra functions. And I'm not going to go over that right here, but you can use specific properties just like algebra has specific properties like commutative property and associative properties. Boolean algebra has the same in certain cases. For one, I'll give you an example. You can have x and y is the same as y and x. And there's plenty of them, but the NAND to Tetris course goes over all of them. So you probably have that written down because I had to write them down too, just to keep them all tracked. All right, so now that we know Boolean logic and Boolean function synthesis and kind of how that all works, of course, I think that and, not, and or are very quickly picked up if you've done any amount of programming whatsoever or have really done much math at all. I think it just comes very quickly to you. If you have a problem with that, leave a comment down below and I'd be happy to help you out further. But from this Boolean logic and Boolean function synthesis, which of course, as you can see, I'm just writing on a blackboard right here, nothing to do with computers. This is just theoretical. But you can take this theory and apply it into physical material or into more conceptual diagrams to make things called logic gates. So logic gates are elementary, uh, an E for elementary. And these are things like the and, the not, and the or. These are just very simple ones. And of course, NAND too. These are just elementary. They're basic, low-level ones. Now, of course, you can also have composite ones. So I'll write C for composite. And these are going to be things like MUX and plenty of others. Composite just means that they're made up of many elementary components. Now that we have an idea of the elementary and composite logic gates, we can start talking about diagrams. So a diagram for AND, you would have two inputs, X and Y, and they go into AND. We'll just call this the AND diagram, and you get an out. So to, here are your inputs, and here's your out. So this is just like the truth table. You have your inputs over here and your output there. Very simple. Diagrams are, at least for me, very straightforward. It's just a nice visual representation of what you want. These diagrams can also represent composite logic gates. So I'll write down an AND3. This is just an AND that takes three different inputs and will compu compute one output. So I'll have an X, a Y, and a Z. So as you can see, X and Y go into one AND. This is just an AND gate right here. And their output goes into an input of another AND right here. Z is the other input into the second AND. And as I just said before, it doesn't matter which input goes in first because it's the exact same. It's all right that it's X and Y into the first AND and that output with Z in the second AND. 
It can be in any other order. But what's important is it has one output here. And this output is only true if every single one of these is true, because if any one of these is false, then one of the ands will fail, which will cause the eventual output to be a fail, a zero at least, not necessarily fail. Now this diagram is not complete. What it's missing is one final big old box around here. And all you have to worry about is the inputs and the output. You don't have to worry about any of this to be able to use AND3. Shimon Shokin talks about one interface and many implementations. Now I like this quote a lot. The interface is this, the in and the out. For the interface, you only have to be worried about what goes in and what comes out, that's it. But the implementation, there can be, in some cases, many implementations for any given um, logic gate. So AND3, this is just the particular implementation that I chose because it's what's shown in the NAND to Tetris course. As we go along and as we get to the project, there's going to be more complicated logic gates that we need to implement, and there will be multiple ways to implement them. But as Shimon says, you have the one interface and many implementations. This is a concept that I like a lot because it carries throughout all of programming. And it's something I struggled with, with a little bit because once you start to get into abstract thinking, things get a little bit more complicated. But for me, this really helped to clear things up. And I know I'll be able to apply this sort of way of thinking into higher level programming languages aside from just this diagram. So I want you to think about that. One interface, many implementations, because I think this is going to be something that reoccurs throughout our journey. Now, this diagram is nice. It's a nice design, it looks very pleasing. However, it's not quite what we're gonna need to build a computer. What we're gonna need is something more uh, formal. And that's where the HDL comes in, the hardware description language. So this is basically just a textual description of a diagram. So if you look here for AND3, it would be a little bit different. I can even write AND3 for you here because as Shimon and Noam say, in the NAND to Tetris course, this HDL hardware description language is very, very simple to learn. Now, I don't know it fully yet, and I do encourage you to check out the uh, hardware description language and hardware simulation uh, sort of resource kit and guide. I'll link that in the description because I'm not gonna be able to explain it 100%. I don't know it 100% yet, but I know it enough to be able to read it and write a little bit of it. I haven't written an AND3 yet, but let's try it right now. So I have the stub for XOR up here, which is actually very simple. And we're just gonna go ahead and pretty much copy it in a way. So we'll write chip AND3, and then you have your ins. Now, very clearly the in, you can see right here, is just the X, Y, and Z. So it does help to create the diagram first because you sort of have a, a good reference. So we'll just have X, Y, and the Z. Now that looks, exactly like it does up there, just an in and some variables, but it's specific for our AND3. And then out, usually you just name it out. Sometimes there's going to be more than one output, but for this one, there's just one, so we could just name it out. Now, this right here is the interface. This is what you have to worry about, the in and the out, which is the in and the out. However, for it to work, you have to worry about the implementation. This starts with parts, it's a keyword. All of these capitalize are keywords. Now this is the implementation. It starts with the keyword parts. I'm not going to go into it here. Shimon and Noam do it very well in the course, but what I want you to see here is how you go from the diagram to the HDL. It's just a textual description. It's very clear. I like it. It makes just as much sense as the diagram. And I think it's pretty easy to go between the two. Now, once you finish implementing the various chipsets, you can take them, save them as an HDL file, and load them into the hardware simulator that's provided with the course. This hardware simulator can simulate it. It can be paired with test files to do systematic testing on the HDL, or once you load it in, you can interactively use it and add your own values to the various inputs and see the output. Now, of course, if you implement it wrong, you'll get bad outputs and if you compare that against the test files it'll be wrong but that's one way to 
sort of see if you implemented it correctly. All right, now I hope that was pretty clear. This is just the first part of week one, which I honestly felt like it was very easy. Even though I'm completely new to this sort of thing, Shimon and Noam explained it very clearly and I just picked it up very quickly. So I'm not gonna spend a horrible amount of time going over it into excruciating detail. If you're following along with the course, you probably already understand this video and didn't even need to watch it. But if you are struggling with any certain parts, go ahead and leave a comment and I'll be sure to help you. As I said though, for me personally, it was fairly easy to pick all this stuff up. Now I know that once I go into the second part of week one and into the project, it'll get a little bit more complicated, so maybe I'll go into more detail in that case. But really for the first part, the most complicated parts is the HDL and the hardware simulator. But I think you can pick those up if you read the material provided in the book and just watch the course and see what Noam and Shimon do. So thanks for watching part one of week one, and I hope that your journey goes smoothly.